So let's now move on to section 143 and 144 of the treatise uh, of the ancient philosophy and of the modern philosophy. Well, of the ancient philosophy is essentially an attack on Aristotelianism, also known as the peripatetic philosophy. And what Hume does in this section is criticise them, indeed rather ridicule them, for being overly uh, dependent on the fictions of the imagination. They get carried away by imaginative fantasies. They're almost like children or poets uh, in being overly influenced by uh, natural tendencies to invent imaginative fictions. And here he's picking on substances, substantial forms, accidents and occult qualities. Now these are things which Hume's audience would also have generally thought to be uh, ridiculous. Uh, he's writing for an audience of modern philosophers. He explains the fictions as arising from the imagination in a very natural way, but uh, what we ought to do as philosophers is be more critical about what the imagination naturally leads us to think. So our most ju judicious philosophers, and he's clearly referring to Locke here, uh, Locke's chapter of our complex ideas of substances, consider that our ideas of bodies are nothing but collections formed by the mind of the ideas of the several distinct sensible qualities of which objects are composed. So Locke had said that our ideas of particular substances are made up of the collections of ideas that we have about their properties. So when we think of gold, for example, we think of uh, a combination of qualities, including the colour, the texture, the, 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 the mass, the, the weight, and so on. Um, now, Locke, actually, in entitling his chapter of our complex ideas of substances, he is himself attacking the Aristotelians, who had thought that we have a simple idea of substances. And Hume is essentially here agreeing with Locke, but he's giving an account of how that uh, false idea of simple substances comes about. The smooth and uninterrupted progress of the thought readily deceives the mind and makes us ascribe an identity to the changeable succession. So we, we've seen this from 142. Uh, <clears throat> we, we see objects gradually changing. Our imagination uh, overlooks the changes and because we naturally think of something as um, undergoing coherent gradual changes we're seduced into thinking of it as a sim simple continuing thing. Now <clears throat> okay so we see an object uh, over time changing in small ways but generally appearing much the same and we think of it as one and the same thing. That actually implies, Hume thinks, that it would have to be completely unchanging. To preserve identity, it must be uh, literally the same over time. Now, obviously, when we think more carefully, we realize that things are actually undergoing changes. So we have a kind of inconsistency in our thinking. Uh, we tend to think of the thing as identical over time and hence absolutely the same over time, but we realise that externally it's changing. So we reconcile that contradiction by imagining uh, some substance underneath the sensible qualities which remains the same. So again, this is very much the sort of thing that he's been explaining in 142. So notice that Hume's discussion in 142, where he's talking about uh, how we come to have the idea of body, is applicable both to the ancient philosophers and the modern philosophers. Uh, he, he, both the ancient, ancients whom he's discussing now have one particular idea of substance. We'll see that in the next section of the modern philosophy, 
he criticizes the modern philosophers such as Locke with their distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Uh, but both of them are subject to the kind of uh, thing, the kind of illusions of the imagination that have been outlined in 142. Okay, so the ancient philosophers are ascribing the identity of things to a single simple substance underlying the object's qualities, a principle of union or cohesion amongst those qualities. But if the substance is simple, if the underlying substance is simple, how comes it that different instances of these, uh, of these material things have different qualities? For example, different colours, different shape, etc. Well, the Aristotelians have to invent something called substantial form, which they bring in to explain that. And then the, the qualities which are not essential to the object are ascribed as accidental qualities. So you get to the notion of accidents. And Hume wants to say that all of these notions are meaningless. People don't know what they're talking about. Uh, these philosophers suppose a substance supporting, which they do not understand, and an accident supported, of which they have as imperfect an idea. The whole system, therefore, is entirely incomprehensible. So he's extremely critical of the ancient philosophy. Now he goes on to attack uh, <coughs> the notions of faculty and occult quality. And here he is referring back implicitly to his discussion of causation. So people naturally imagine that they perceive a connection between constantly conjoined objects. When you see A followed by B again and again, you see an A, you naturally expect a B, you feel, as it were, a connection in the mind. Okay, that's all familiar from Treatise 1, 3, 14. When we look at the objects themselves, we find no such connection apparent in their qualities. Now, the just inference to draw, Hume says, is that we have no idea of power or agency separate from the mind and belonging to causes. That's very similar to what he's been saying at the end of 1314. But what the ancient philosophers do is invent the words faculty and occult quality. They need only say that any phenomenon which puzzles them arises from a faculty or occult quality. So, um, a well-known example of this is the, uh, the ridicule that Molière gives of the notion of occult qualities in Le Malade Imaginaire, one of his plays. Um, and there a doctor is asked, why does opium make one sleep? Oh, it's because it has a soporific virtue whose nature it is to stupefy the senses. So, you ask, why does opium make you sleep? Answer, it's got a sleep-inducing quality. Not explanatory. Um, and this is the kind of thing that Hume here is ridiculing. Again, his audience would be very sympathetic to this. But among all the instances wherein the peripatetics have shown they were guided by every trivial propensity of the imagination, no one is more remarkable than their sympathies, antipathies, and horrors of a vacuum. There is a very remarkable inclination in human nature to bestow on external objects the same emotions which it observes in itself. This inclination, it is true, is suppressed by a little reflection and only takes place in children, poets, and the ancient philosophers. What excuse shall we find to justify our philosophers in so signal a weakness? So he gives an example of um, a child who hurts himself on a stone, might hit the stone in anger. So the child is attributing intentions to the stone, as though the stone has been naughty for hurting it. Uh, now when we grow up, we get past all that sort of thing. But he's saying, essentially, that the ancient philosophers, when they talk about sympathies, antipathies, horrors of a vacuum, they're doing exactly the same thing. And here he's referring to the basis of Aristotelian science. Aristotelian science um, attributes the tendency of stones to fall 
to a sort of desire, a striving, to reach the center of the universe. Um, and Hume is saying, actually, this is just like the child who hits the stone. Now, notice the important phrase there. Um, they're guided by every trivial propensity of the imagination. So he's attacking the ancient philosophers but for being carried away by these illusions of the imagination. We'll see that this plays an important role in what's to come. Because he might seem to be inconsistent here. Remember, think back to the discussion of induction. Uh, Hume asked whether induction is founded on reason, and he came to the conclusion that it isn't, that the foundation of induction is the imagination. It's the custom, our tendency after we've seen A followed by B repeatedly, when we see an A, to extrapolate and expect a B. And that's not dependent on reason, it's dependent on the imagination. So how is it fair of Hume to criticise the ancient philosophers for basing their philosophy on the principles of the imagination. He's doing exactly the same, isn't he? Well, there's a famous passage in which he addresses this. He distinguishes between two sorts of imaginative principles, uh, some of them respectable, some not. So I'm going to read out this whole passage. It's a particularly notable one, and it's often been thought to give a sort of key to Hume's answer to scepticism. We'll see that in the treatise, the answer doesn't quite work, uh, but arguably it is retained in uh, his later work, and there perhaps does. In order to justify myself, to explain how my philosophy is not subject to the objection that I've just given against the ancient philosophers, I must distinguish in the imagination betwixt the principles which are permanent, irresistible, and universal, such as the customary transition from causes to effects and from effects to causes, and the principles which are changeable, weak, and irregular, such as those I have just now taken notice of, that is, the principles that influence the ancient philosophers. The former, that's the ones that are uh, permanent, irresistible, and universal, are the foundation of all our thoughts and actions, so that, that upon their removal, human nature must immediately perish and go to ruin. The latter are neither unavoidable to mankind nor necessary, or so much as useful in the conduct of life, but on the contrary are observed only to take place in weak minds, and being opposite to the other principles of conduct and reasoning, may easily be subverted by a due contrast and opposition. For this reason, the former are received by philosophy and the latter rejected. So he's saying that amongst the principles of the imagination, that there are some that are respectable, that we couldn't live without, that are therefore universal, everybody has them, like induction. So that's okay. Uh, we as philosophers accept those and base our uh, theorizing on those. But there are other ones that are changeable, weak, and irregular, the kind of thing that makes you uh, assign purposes to a stone. Those sorts of principles are to be rejected. Now, there's an interesting footnote in uh, earlier in Book 1, Part 3 of the treatise, um, a footnote that Hume actually took the trouble to have inserted into the treatise while it was in press. So he had the footnote put on what's called a cancel sheet uh, to replace the original page, and he cut out some of the uh, previous text in order to make room for it. So he obviously thought it was quite important. And this is ad essentially addressing exactly the same point. He's distinguishing between two different senses of the imagination. In one sense, the imagination is the faculty that controls the vivacity of our ideas, uh, that of, to which all the associative principles and so on belong, including custom. In the other sense, the imagination only concerns uh, those whimsies and prejudices which are rejected under the opprobrious character of being the offspring of the imagination. So when we criticize people, for being carried away by the imagination. We mean it in this other sense, the sense in which 
uh, imaginative principles, our whimsies and prejudices. So distinguish between those two senses. And Hume want, is quite happy to acknowledge that his philosophy is founded on the imagination in the former sense, the broader one. Uh, but he obviously is criticizing the ancient philosophers for founding their philosophy on the whimsies and prejudices uh, sense of the imagination. OK, let's now move on to of the modern philosophy. That's uh, Treatise 144. The modern philosophy, typified by Locke, uh, claims to be based much more solidly than the ancient philosophy, not on whimsies and prejudices, but on the solid, permanent, and consistent principles of the imagination. Now Hume's going to argue that actually it isn't nearly as solid as it might appear. So a key pillar of the modern philosophy is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Secondary qualities are supposed to exist only in the mind, Primary qualities are attributed to objects themselves. Uh, Hume suggests that the only satisfactory argument for drawing that distinction is to do with variations, how things look differently in different contexts. So the argument is that if different impressions from the same sense arise from some object, suppose an object looks different in different lights or looks different when we're suffering from some disease or tastes differently depending on our situation. Um, we clearly cannot attribute all of the qualities that we sense to the object. That would seem to be a contradiction. But on the other hand, our sensory impressions are of the same kind. And to take an example that Locke gives, uh, suppose one of my hands has been in cold water and one of them in hot water, and I put my hands into a bowl of warm water and it feels warm to one and cold to the other. Uh, it can't be both warm and... Uh, sorry, it can't be both hot and cold. But on the other hand, my impression of hot and my impression of cold, those feelings are of the same kind. So if they can't both belong to the object, it seems that neither can. Again, if something looks different colours uh, from different perspectives or in different lights. Um, it can't have both colours uh, because they contradict each other. But since both impressions are of the same kind, the natural conclusion seems to be that it doesn't have either of them. Now, notice that this is an argument um, using a causal principle. From like effects, we uh, suppose like, we presume like causes. And that's quite important. We'll see that he refers back to it later. So that's the argument that he sees as providing the basis for the primary-secondary quality distinction. Um, if you know Locke, uh, I think you, you would rather doubt that that's the main argument that Locke is depending on. Um, but at any rate, um, Hume, following Berkeley, sees the argument, as it were, from illusion or from mistaken perceptions as an important reason for it. And he follows on with a very Barclayan objection. Remember, Barclay objected to Locke uh, that you couldn't form an idea of a primary quality abstracted from the secondary quality. Because whenever we see a shape, we see a coloured shape, you can't actually form an idea, according to Barclay and Hume, of a shape that isn't coloured. And Hume's argument is essentially here a, a, a refinement of that. He's going to argue that if all the secondary qualities exist only in the mind, not in objects, you can't actually form an idea of a solid extended object uh, independent of the mind. The problem is um, that to form an idea of an extended body, my idea of extension has to have some content. I have to have some idea of what it is that's extended. Now, I can get ideas of extension from sight or touch and ultimately from atomic ideas of, of colour. Remember the minima uh, from uh, Book 1, Part 2? Or um, simple solid ideas, which I get from touch. But the problem is, colour is excluded from any real existence. In other words... The modern philosophers say that colour is a secondary quality. It's in the mind, not in objects. So that won't give you an idea of an external 
uh, object. And our idea of solidity is parasitic on our idea of an object. The idea of solidity is that of two objects which cannot penetrate each other. So unless you've got something to provide content to the notion of an object, you cannot form the idea of one object uh, which can't penetrate another one. You've got to have some independent content to that idea, and you can't get it from the notion of solidity. Our modern philosophy, therefore, leaves us no just nor satisfactory idea of matter. So Hume elaborates on this argument at some length, and it's an interesting passage to read. I, I, I recommend that you do. The conclusion is that there is a direct and total opposition betwixt our reason and our senses, or more properly, betwixt those conclusions we form from cause and effect and those that persuade us of the continued and independent existence of body. So remember, he's had the causal argument that from which we conclude that secondary qualities don't exist outside the mind, and now he's followed that up with an argument that says, uh, without appeal to secondary qualities, we cannot actually form any coherent idea of uh, an extended body. So the conclusion of 144 of the treatise seems profoundly sceptical. Hume has shown, apparently, that there is a conflict between two pretty basic parts of our um, mental capacities. That is, our causal reasoning, without which we can't form any conclusions beyond memory and senses, and our belief in uh, an external world. Right. Okay, now let's move on to uh, the final parts of Book One of the Treatise. The soul and the self, which are discussed in 145 and 146, and then I'll be finishing off with some words about Hume's conclusion. So, after 144, Hume says, right, we're going to leave behind the external world and turn to the internal world. We found all these contradictions in our thoughts about external objects. From 142, all those problems about identity, uh, and now 144, we find this conflict between causal reasoning and belief in body, now let's go on to the world of the mind, the intellectual world. And Hume says here we won't find any contradictions like that. Um, as we'll see, uh, that complacent view does not last. So I'm going to just sketch first of all what goes on in 145 um, of the immateriality of the soul. It's a section that is widely ignored, actually, in books on Hume, which I think is a great shame. It's actually quite a rich section, and it's got some parts in it that are very important. What I'm going to do now is just give you a very quick uh, guide through what is discussed. So at the beginning, Hume attacks the notion of mental substance. Of course, he's already attacked the notion of physical substance. And the attack is in very much the same spirit. Um, he appeals to the copy principle uh, to deny that there is any impression from which this idea can be derived. And he condemns the notion of mental substance as meaningless. So the question as to whether our uh, souls, as it were, consist of mental substance is shown to be a meaningless question. We don't even understand the terms in which it's posed. Then, from 1457 to 16, Hume embarks on a discussion of the location uh, of perceptions and whether perceptions are extended. Here he says quite clearly that the only perceptions that have extension or location are those of sight or touch. Again, you can see this is linking up with what he said about how we form our ideas of extension in the context of external body. It's of perceptions either of sight or touch. So other perceptions, like smell, for example, has no physical location. When we experience a smell, uh, that is not physically located, not spatially located. Now, <clears throat> nevertheless, suppose I smell a fig, 
I naturally attribute the smell and the taste when I taste it to the physical object itself. That's an illusion. It's a mistake. We naturally do it because we're so used to associating the physical fig with the taste and the smell. They come together so often that we naturally attribute the taste and smell as though they were spatially located. Now, Hume actually refers forward to this passage from the discussion of uh, causation. 1, 3, 14, 25. You'll see there's a note there, footnote 32, when he, <coughs> he says that this illusion is similar to the illusion whereby we spread our minds on external objects when we attribute ca causation, causal powers, uh, to external objects. So that's a passage which sort of backs up the, uh, the interpretation of Hume on causation as uh, saying that we're making a mistake when we view causal powers as directly attributed to external objects or attributable. One four five seventeen to twenty eight um, is a discussion of Spinoza. It can be a little bit difficult to interpret. Um, it seems here that, that Hume is really having some fun at the expense of people who criticise Spinoza. Sp so Spinoza is widely considered at the time to be an atheist. Uh, he has the hideous hypothesis that the entire world consists of one simple substance, God or nature. Um, but clearly it's not a conventional idea of God, hence uh, he is viewed with nearly as much repugnance as Hobbes. And what... Hume does is ingeniously turn the objections against Spinoza against the idea of a simple soul. So theologians believe that we have a simple, uncompounded soul, that the soul is essentially simple. And we have all these ideas, but those ideas are supposed to be modifications of, somehow of this simple soul. Spinoza believes that the world all consists of one simple substance and that the objects in the world are modifications of this one simple substance. So any objections to the latter apply also to the former. So if, it's quite an interesting discussion, um, not particularly essential, I think, for understanding Hume's philosophy. As I say, he's more having fun at the expense of... Um, certain theologians, in fact, you know, the, conve the conventional orthodoxy at the time. The most important part of this section comes later, and here he's defending materialism. So having uh, defended Spinoza, he now goes on to defend Hobbes. Uh, you can see that this is a section not calculated to appeal to uh, orthodox Christians. So here he considers the standard argument which many, many philosophers had brought against Hobbes. Hobbes claimed that everything that exists is material, hence materialist. And the standard objection was that matter cannot possibly think. Since you can't have thinking matter, that proves that there must be something more than the material world. In particular, we must have immaterial souls, etc., uh, Locke had used a somewhat similar argument to prove the existence of God. He said, uh, by sort of cosmological reasoning, there must be a first cause, but the first cause can't be material because ma matter by itself could not cause thought. And the arguments based on the, uh, the general uh, view that there's so much difference between thought and matter in, in motion that there's no way the former could arise from the latter. Well, it seems quite a tempting argument, and yet nothing in the world is more easy than to refute it. We need only to reflect on what has been proved at large, that to consider the matter a priori, anything may produce anything, and that we shall never discover a reason why any object may or may not be the cause of any other, however great or however little the resemblance may be between them. So it's a direct appeal to Hume's analysis of causation. He said... Causation is a matter of constant conjunction. That's it. 
You don't need resemblance between cause and effect. And it's an empirical question, what is constantly conjoined with what? In fact, we find by experience that uh, material motion and thought are constantly conjoined, which, being all the circumstances that enter into the idea of cause and effect, we may certainly conclude that motion may be and actually is the cause of thought and perception. Again, a direct appeal to his analysis of causation in terms of constant conjunction. As the constant conjunction of objects constitutes the very essence of cause and effect, matter and motion may often be regarded as the causes of thought, as far as we have any notion of that relation. In uh, 145.31, he introduces a dilemma. And in the re remainder um, of the paragraph, he argues for the second horn of the dilemma. That is, he very clearly says, all objects which we find constantly conjoined are upon that account to be regarded as causes and effects. And when he repeats that later, he says, are upon that account alone to be regarded as causes and effects. So you establish a constant conjunction, that's enough. That gives you a causal relation. That suffices to ascribe causation between them. So the, these, end passages, these end paragraphs in uh, 145 are, I think, very significant. They, together with the discussions of liberty and necessity, are where Hume actually applies the definitions of causation that he's given in 1314. And in both cases, they're in aid of a similar sort of enterprise. What he's trying to do is vindicate the application of causal reasoning, causal scientific inductive reasoning, to the mental world. And um, here what he's saying is there is no conflict between having causal relations between physical things and mental things. That's fine. It's just a matter of constant conjunction. In Of Liberty and Necessity, which we've seen before, he's using the same analysis of causation to say that uh, necessity applies just as much to the operations of the mind as it does to the operations of body. We can have a deterministic science of mind just like we can have a deterministic science of body. So 1314 of the treatise, the famous discussion of the idea of necessary connection, this is where it has the payoff for Hume in supporting materialism, supporting determinism, bringing uh, empirical science, the experimental method of reasoning, into moral subjects, into the science of the mind. And that is the subtitle of the treatise, an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. So this is quite, quite a key part of Hume's philosophy. But <clears throat> one final thing about 145, there's, there's an interesting mistake at the end of it. Um, the final paragraph starts off by emphasising Hume's main point. But then if you look at the last two sentences, you'll see that he starts referring to the immortality of the soul. He hasn't said anything about the immortality of the soul. He's been talking about the immateriality of the soul. And suddenly he seems to be referring to arguments which aren't there in the text. What's going on? Well, we have the essay of the immortality of the soul, which Hume nearly published in 1755, but then suppressed. And it ended up being published only after his death. He'd left it for posthumous publication. It was too dangerous. Uh, it's an excellent little essay, lovely epitome of Hume's philosophy, applied to the question of the immortality of the soul. Well, in a letter to Henry Hume, who later became Lord Keynes, in 1737, Hume said, I am at present uh, castrating my work, that is, cutting off its noble parts, uh, in order that it shouldn't give offence, because he wanted to give the treatise to Joseph Butler, uh, Bishop Joseph Butler, and others, uh, in the hope of getting, uh, as it were, a good report. So he cut out various religious discussions, um, probably of something 
a predecessor of, of miracles, which later turned up in the inquiry section 10. And it seems almost certain that Hume had, at, this, at some point in the treatise, in the manuscript, he, his discussion of immortality, or something like it, was there. Okay, let's now move on to the penultimate section of book one of the treatise, famous section of personal identity. So, first of all, Hume wields the copy principle to deny that we have any idea of the self which is anything like the, the sort of standard notion. Uh, the self is supposed to have perfect identity and simplicity. Well, when we look inside ourselves, look at the impressions that we get, we don't find any impression that corresponds to that kind of idea. So uh, there's no way that we can have a legitimate idea of the self of that kind. When I look inside myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. So this drives us to Hume's famous bundle theory of the self, or at least bund the bundle theory of our idea of the self. Now, <clears throat> think back to what Hume said about the idea of substance. Uh, he criticised those who think we have some simple idea of substance, the ancient philosophers, for example. But at the same point, he praised uh, Locke for saying that we have a complex ideas of substances, that our ideas of substance is, as it were, uh, an, an amalgam of all the various qualities that we attribute to it. And he seems to be saying something similar here about the idea of the self. The legitimate idea of the self is not simple and uniform. It's the idea of a bundle or collection of different perceptions which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in a perpetual flux and movement. So that's the bundle theory for which Hume is very famous. So the rest of the section is devoted largely to explaining how it is that we are led to attribute an identity to the self. And he's going along very similar moves to those that we saw in 142 um, of scepticism with regard to the senses. Just as when we look at external objects and we find that they exhibit uh, constancy and coherence, we are seduced by that into thinking of them as persisting identical things. Even though strictly something can't be identical over time unless it's completely unchanging, our imagination seduces us into making that mistake. And now he's going to say that our idea of the self likewise arises from a similar cause. So he's going to explain our propension to ascribe an identity to these successive per perceptions and to suppose ourselves possessed of an invariable and uninterrupted existence. Think about when we attribute identity to plants and animals. Plants change over time, but they change slowly. So we naturally uh, mistake the gradual change for a continuing identity. Again, I don't think that Hume's discussion of identity, frankly, is his strongest philosophical card. Uh, he does, as I've mentioned before, tend to just assume that identity over time can only make sense if you have unchangeability. Um, and that seems to me, at any rate, to be something of a confusion between numerical identity and similarity. Um, in his later works, Hume does not discuss the notion of identity. This kind of thing disappears. Um, so I personally am inclined to think that it's, his view about identity is not, as it were, part of his long-term settled view. Anyway, here he's going to say very similar things about personal identity to what he says about external objects. As I say, we, we see gradual change 
kind of constancy and coherence, and that naturally leads us to think that there's something identical there. We realize that that's absurd when we actually have noticed that it's changed, the thing has changed a lot over time. We look at a plant in one season and then another season. Oh no, it's actually very different. So uh, we feign some new and unintelligible principle that binds the things together. And when we do that kind of thing in the case of personal identity, that's how we run into the notion of a soul and self and substance. So again, we've got that notion of substance. The notion of substance, Hume is suggesting, uh, at least when it's thought of as something simple and continuing, arises from this kind of imaginative mistake. So, to prove this hypothesis of how we come to ascribe personal identity, Hume sets out to show that the objects which are variable or interrupted, and yet are supposed to continue the same, are such only as consist of a succession of parts connected together by resemblance, contiguity, or causation. In other words, by the associative principles of the mind. Remember, resemblance, contiguity, causation, Hume has identified way back in uh, Book 1, Part 1 as the three principles of association of ideas. And he goes on to illustrate this. Uh, he talks about the circumstances in, we, in which we most naturally attribute identity to things when changes are gradual, uh, when they are proportionately small, at least at a time, and when things serve to some common end or purpose. He gives an example. He suppose there's a church built somewhere, an old church, and it falls down or it's knocked down and then replaced by another church. Because they're serving the same purpose, as providing a church for a particular town or village, we naturally talk of them as the same church, even though they clearly aren't. So when we attribute personal identity, it's just one more example of the same kind of thing. Obviously, all this is saying that the attribu attribution of personal identity that we make is standardly mistaken. If we think of personal identity as involving any more than that bundle, we're actually making a mistake. But to justify the claim that it is a mistake, Hume again emphasizes, look inside yourself. You won't actually see any real connection between those perceptions. So our notions of personal identity proceed entirely from the smooth and uninterrupted progress of the thought along a train of connected ideas. Now, this might seem puzzling. You might think, well, look, if there's a train of connected ideas, what is it that's being seduced into this illusion? Doesn't there have to be an identical person who is suffering, as it were, this seduction in order to be in order to be confused into attributing identity, doesn't there have to be an I that is being confused? And you can see that this sort of um, thing leads to real big questions about what's going on in Hume's account of personal identity. So a lot of secondary literature um, is, uh, attributes some of the problems that Hume has to that kind of thought. But what Hume seems to be doing is explaining the genesis of a particular mistaken idea of personal identity. Um, and I think if you take it in that way, you don't have to read him as fundamentally confused here. So he talks about resemblance and causation and how they give rise to the idea. And he explains why memory is particularly key. Memory produces resemblance between our perceptions. When I remember something... The perception, the memory perception that arises in my mind, the idea of memory, is very resembling to the thing of which it's a memory. Um, when we are concerned about our future, we think about the future, that brings up emotions which are causally connected with the future. So there are resembling and causal connections, and both of these are um, largely mediated by the memory. So, it's no surprise that Locke saw memory as the key to personal identity. But Hume is insistent that 
Memory isn't the whole thing. It's not that memory makes personal identity. Um, it partly does, but it also discovers personal identity. There is this connection, causal connection, associative connections between our ideas and impressions, and memory reveals that. Now, Hume's theory of personal identity has given rise to very complex and protracted discussions in the secondary literature. Perhaps the main reason for this is that in the appendix to the treatise, so this is published just 21 months later, right, it's published together with book three of the treatise, Hume says, oh dear, my account of personal identity won't work. Upon a more strict review of the section concerning personal identity, I find myself involved in such a labyrinth that I must confess I neither know how to correct my former opinions nor how to render them consistent. Now, it would be nice if Hume at this point had taken the trouble to spell out exactly what the problem is. But he doesn't do that. Or at least the spelling out that he gives is extremely confusing. So it's become something of a, a, an industry amongst Hume scholars to speculate on what is going on. You get probably as many different accounts of this as there are commentators. In short, there are two principles which I cannot render consistent, nor is it in my power to renounce either of them, viz. that all our distinct perceptions are distinct existences and that the mind never perceives any real connection among distinct existences. No contradiction between those two. So why is, it he's, why is he saying that he has such a difficulty in rendering them consistent? Well, I don't propose to go into that, but be aware, if you read Hume on personal identity, a lot of the intricacies of those discussions are driven by trying to make sense of what Hume says here and fitting it in with what is actually in the section of personal identity. So to finish off, let's look very briefly at another very complex section, Treatise 147, conclusion of this book. What makes this very hard to understand is that it's very dynamic. Hume seems to go through a sequence of thoughts and a sequence of emotional changes with those thoughts, uh, going from despair to optimism to complacency. Most of our mental processes have been shown to be dependent on the imagination. But the imagination seems rather inconstant, something that we don't want to rely on. And in fact, Treatise 144 has found a manifest contradiction between two aspects of our imaginative thought, one of them to do with causal reasoning and one of them to do with our belief in the continued existence of matter. We've got that contradiction from the section of the modern philosophy. We've also got confusion about the notion of causation, as revealed at 1.3.14. So Hume is referring back quite explicitly, usually with footnotes, to these various sections. That leads us into a dangerous dilemma. If we assent to every trivial suggestion of the fancy, the imagination, if we follow all the different imaginative principles, we'll be led into contradiction. Moreover, it will also give us ridiculous views, like those of the ancient philosophers. So we don't want to follow all the different principles of the imagination. How are we going to choose which to follow? Well, the natural thing to do is to say, let's just adhere to the general and more established principles of the imagination, the ones that in that famous passage at the beginning of 144, he had used to distinguish his reliance on the imagination from that of the ancient philosophers. Right. The ancient philosophers allow themselves to be pulled around by all these trivial suggestions of the imagination, whereas Hume himself only relies on the general and more established, the causal reasoning, or at least that's what it seems at that point. The trouble is, if you think back to 141 of scepticism with regard to reason, Hume has said that the only thing that stops us degenerating into total scepticism about everything is, unfortunately a trivial suggestion of the imagination or a trivial propensity of the imagination, namely that when we go through a complex argument, we lose track of it. That's pretty trivial, or it looks that way. 
So Hume's left at the end of book one of the treatise with a real problem. It seemed like we had a way of resolving it, of going for the general and more established principles of the imagination, going with causal reasoning, with induction and so forth, and putting aside the things that lead towards the fictions of the ancient philosophers. But 141 casts very serious doubt on that. And it seems, in 147, it's a complex matter that many different interpreters have many different views on this section. Haven't, there's no, this isn't the place to discuss that at length. But it seems that Hume's answer to scepticism in the treatise comes down to the same sorts of thing that he was saying at the end of 142, when he said that carelessness and inattention uh, provide the only remedy. Again, a famous passage. I dine... I play a game of backgammon, I converse, and am merry with my friends, and afterwards these speculations appear so cold and strained and ridiculous that I, that I cannot find it in my heart to enter them any farther. It looks in the treatise as though Hume thinks there is no satisfactory philosophical answer to all these sceptical problems. We just have to leave them behind us when we go out of the study, dine, play a game of backgammon, and so forth. I think Hume gets much closer to a satisfactory answer in the inquiry. Um, if you look at section 12 of the inquiry particularly, that is Hume's mature discussion of scepticism, and there he comes to a much more satisfactory view. He's left behind the problems about identity. He no longer has that argument about scepticism with regard to reason. And as a result, he is able to rely on causation and induction the general and more established principles of the imagination without running into inconsistency or total scepticism. Okay, thank you.